Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, despite the fact that Sue's pie crust recipe seems to be more popular than these videos, we, uh, I uh, endeavor to continue on. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in Thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful again for the privilege and the opportunity to fellowship in Thy precious Word. May the Holy Spirit take the hour, may He filter out that which is error, but seal to our hearts truth. May the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted. May we be brought deeper and deeper into thy precious word and into the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. In this Bible uh, survey uh, series, we're in the uh, New Testament. We're in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, which I tend to I prefer to actually refer to it as the Acts of Christ or Acts of God. We're in the second chapter, uh, beginning the paragraph at uh, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. We've heard Peter declare by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Jews had done exactly what God had before determined to be done in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they were pricked in their hearts. Uh, they asked what to do. Uh, we looked at Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized. Uh, I pointed out to you that the exhortation is there that they should do this in the sphere of uh, Jesus Christ because they already have, they already have the remission of sins provided by the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, beginning then with verse 4. 41, uh, then they that gladly received His Word were baptized. I don't believe that these uh, Bible surveys are the place to, for a detailed discussion on baptism. Uh, there are many, uh, many accounts you can read on this particular passage of Scripture in most of them, it's, it's assumed that baptism here means with water. And uh, the debate is pretty much what method is used. Uh, we read in the 41st verse, They that gladly received uh, were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, uh, 3,000 lives. Now, if you happen to believe in sprinkling, uh, this is a very strong verse because uh, you might be able to sprinkle 3,000, but you probably wouldn't be able to immerse them uh, that many uh, in any place in the local area of Jerusalem. And so the sprinkling uh, uh, advocates, they believe this is a strong passage of Scripture for their position. Uh, you know, because they point out things like, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, inconceivable that this many could have been immersed. I'm simply going to suggest to you that I believe that the human mind becomes all tangled up in a consideration of the method and misses the truth of the passage. I see no constraint uh, to believe water was used at all. I'm not suggesting that it, that it wasn't because I don't know and neither do you. It does seem rather consistent in the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit speaks of baptism with water, He always says water. And it's significant in this passage of Scripture that water is omitted. I personally am, am of the persuasion, uh, and that of course doesn't make it truth, uh, allow me to hasten to point out that I'm not asking anyone to agree with me, just to think with me. 
I want to learn the truth of these passages the same as you. My personal conviction is that whenever the Holy Spirit means identification with water, He always says so. Now John was baptizing with water because there was much water there. The Lord Jesus Christ says that John indeed baptized you with water, but when He shall come, the Spirit of truth, He'll baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Now I pointed out in, in uh, many videos that the, the word baptized is not translated. It's the Greek word. All the other words that you're reading are English words that are uh, an attempt by the translators to tell you what the Greek words mean. But when we reach the, the Greek word baptizo, uh, though we don't translate it, uh, we simply transliterate it letter for letter into the English uh, language. Uh, and, and just leave it up to you. Uh, I've pointed out the importance of context as well. But that, that has become so sanctified in biblical translation that hardly any modern translation makes any attempt whatsoever to translate the word. I'm not sure what meaning you want to use. There are hundreds of them in the Greek language. I am persuaded that the, and strongly so, that the word means basically to come under the control or the power of some other force. And I've often suggested that the word identify or identification would be a better translation. And I, I remind you, as, as we went through our study in Romans, Romans chapter 6, do, do you not all know that, that you have been baptized, identified with uh, Christ, uh, baptized into the body of Christ? It's a spiritual baptism. Uh, A terrorist is, is identified with the terrorist group he represents. He comes under the authority, under the direction and the power of that group. Now I think that that verse, that 40, 41st verse, simply means that there were 3,000 who were identified by the Holy Spirit as members of the body of Christ. You do not become a member of the body of Christ when you do something. You're a member of the body of Christ by an action of, of a work of God. And it, and it may be months, it may be days, it may be years, who knows, uh, you know, uh, later before you ever find out about it. Now, just as a side note, uh, you know, that on that 3,000, uh, Aaron, while uh, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, you know, he's, he's pressured by the, the Israelites to make them idols to worship and, and bowing to that pressure. He has this, a molten calf made from various pieces of jewelry. You, you all know the story. And when Moses finally comes down off Mount Sinai, you know, he sees the, the, the gross sins being committed by the people and he becomes angry and he has the tribe of Levi who remained loyal to God go throughout the, the entire Israelite camp and kill what will uh, end up being 3,000 people who committed idolatry with the calf. Uh, Exodus uh, 37, 28, the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000. Now, you can do what you want with that. I just thought I'd point that out as a, as a side note, I think that the significance of the verse is that these were identified as members of the fellowship there in Jerusalem. Then verse 42 uh, through to the end of the chapter are verses related uh, to the scriptural presentation of communism. Now I'm going to suggest that that idea is totally foreign uh, to scripture totally unbiblical. We have no uh, presentation of commun communism here or anywhere else. 
uh, in the case of uh, 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 Ananias, uh, Sapphira, uh, in the fifth chapter, uh, you look at you look at uh, uh, at them. That's the that's the same thing we're talking about here in the, in the second chapter. The Holy Spirit has Peter say to Ananias, "While you had the field, was it not your own? Was it not your own?" Now that's not communism. That's capitalism. Uh, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thine heart, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, and he gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, uh, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. Buried him. God said you could have done anything with the money, anything that you wanted with that money. Belonged to you. It was your money. You could have bought a boat, uh, could have gone fishing, could have bought your own airplane, could have invested in government securities, could have done anything you wanted. Wasn't it yours? Why then did you have to lie to God about it? That cannot possibly be any presentation of communism whatsoever. It's a presentation of personal property and personal ownership. It belonged to Ananias, but he had a stewardship over that. The argument is not that he was not communistic uh, in, his, in his tendencies. The argument is that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit about the distribution of those funds which the Bible straightly declared to be his own. Could have done anything he wanted with it. He shouldn't have lied. Now if we go back to the second chapter, uh, they continued steadfastly. And that's, I'm going to suggest, that's what we ought to do. Now, I recognize that there, there was always a, a sort of a, an enthusiasm in a new uh, work. We saw it back in the Old Testament. It was all uh, kinds of, of lack of enthusiasm and idolatry that crept into Israel. And then all of a sudden, there was a fervor to rebuild the temple. And people gave more than they needed uh, to build the tabernacle. Uh, and there are a lot, a lot of new works where we get all wrapped up in the enthusiasm. I recognize that. I don't think that's why the Holy Spirit is giving this account. Uh, however, I believe the account is that this is the way we ought to be in our fellowship with God and with one another. Where His Word is key, central in it all. First of all, it was a, a continuance which was steadfast. Now, sometimes... Uh, that's difficult to do because the more we learn about one another, the more easily it becomes to discover our differences. Secondly, they continued in the apostles' teaching. Now, I don't believe that that is saying that uh, you should find uh, a man that you agree with and then continue in his teaching. I believe that the expression... The, the doctrine is the Word of God, or if you prefer it, it, it could uh, just be, well, y'all need to follow me into the temple because I know everything. Dearly beloved, the Lord delivered that word to them and said that they would be witnesses. And when we finish with the Apostle Paul, we have the completion of the Word of God. And I don't think that you should look at that as though the translation is telling you that they agreed with the, 
with the apostles, but that they agreed, they continued in the Word of God. And that's what we ought to do. They continued in fellowship. And I believe that fellowship is a study of the, of the Word of God with more than just one person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that, that you can study the Word in private. Of course, you, you should do that. I do that constantly, and so should you. But I believe that that in itself is insufficient. You know, if, if, you, look, if you look at the manna as God gave it, you know, surely there's no constraint with God. I mean, He could have done anything He wanted. Why didn't He put the manna in their refrigerator where they wouldn't have to go out and gather it? Of course, if he wanted to, you know, I, I suppose he, he could have just put it in their stomachs where that they'd get up and they'd, they'd burp and say, boy, that was fantastic. You know, I, I didn't even know about that. I, you know, I was asleep. He could have done any of those things, but he didn't. Now, he rained it down in abundance and then he expected you to go out and gather it. Now, I suppose that there was an Israelite, uh, you know, here or there who expected you to go out and, or, or there was a, a few that, uh, who, who waited till everybody else was done or, or you got up early in the morning before anybody started. But I, I would think in the main, if I could get your mind to wander just a moment, uh, what normally happened is that the Israelites were out there as a body gathering manna and they probably spoke to one another. You know, there, there might have been an occasional case where, you know, where so-and-so isn't speaking to so-and-so. But basically, God gave the manna in a way which made it very, very easy for fellowship and the gathering of the Word of God. I believe the manna is a picture of the Word of God. They continued in the breaking of bread. I don't think that means that they invited each other to one another's homes to have a meal, uh, even though that probably occurred. I think the expression there is in the communion or in the Lord's Supper, uh, whatever you want to call it. Not in the physical exercise of the elements, but in the exercise of the Word of God. If you remember in Corinthians, you know, our, it, we looked at how our communion is the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. I think that the breaking of the bread there is, is more properly, uh, I recognize that they had their love feast and they actually had bread and wine, but I believe the Holy Spirit is emphasizing the spiritual feasting upon the Word of God. And in prayer and in worship, folks, those are basically the reasons that we gather together. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, of course, the word fear there does not mean terror. You know, it's the same word, but that word also means respect. You know, we do that even now, our language. You know, I was, I was afraid my wife wouldn't like the way I swept the floor. You know, is the guy saying that he thought maybe that, that his wife was going to beat him up or shoot him? I, no, you know, it, it's out of reverence or respect. Uh, for his wife, that he says he was afraid, that she wouldn't have liked what he did. We use the word the same way. You know, we could be terrified of a grizzly bear, or we could be af afraid that the flowers we got our girlfriend w w wind wound up in the trash. You know, we use the word exactly the same way. The fear here is reverence and respect that came upon every soul 
that is every life. Many signs and, uh, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. That's in perfect agreement with the Word of God because he says, first of all, that the, the Jews require a sign, and secondly, that th these things will continue until the Word of God is complete. And, uh, and we studied in Corinthians, we'll, we'll see it again in, in the survey, that that is in fact exactly what happened. All that believed were together and had all things in common. All things. Now, the verse, the verse almost sounds like everybody sold everything they had and put it in a pot, you know, and then they, uh, and they all lived like a kibbutz. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, a kibbutz, it's a, it's a, it's a commune sort of, you know, uh, Israeli, uh, uh, settlement, uh, usually agricultural, uh, sometimes industrial, in which all the wealth is held in common. You know, profits are reinvested in the settlement after members have been provided with the basics of things, what they need, food, clothing, shelter, uh, medical care, whatever. Uh, in fact, uh, there are those who suggest that, and even strongly, that uh, in modern literature that a kibbutz in Israel is as close to a Christian community as anything that you can imagine. Now, my personal opinion, besides the fact that now we have Israel becoming like China or North Korea or Venezuela or, or you name it, that is as close to a devilish community as, as anybody can imagine. But that, that tends to shock people when I say that. I know it shocks a lot of young people who've actually gone over there and participated, you know, uh, lived in a, a kibbutz and uh, really enjoyed how the process works. You know, it's, it's a devilish system and I can't imagine the Christian mind that's enlightened by the Word of God, you know, suggesting in any way that it is a, a super system because it isn't. And that's not what took place here. The language is quite clear. It's not quite as clear in the English as it could be, but the language is quite clear that what they did is willingly distribute of what they owned to those who had need. Uh, it, doesn't, it does not say that they sold all, like each individual sold all their possession. It doesn't say that. Now, there was selling going on. The Greek word for sell is there, but it was a collective as, you know, each one was, was involved in, in that selling to help those in need. It doesn't say they sold all their possessions. What it does say is that they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them as every man had need. Now, we don't do that today. You know, in the Old Testament, God said there shouldn't be any poor in the land. Uh, we'll soon see in, in, in the fourth chapter a beggar. I believe God says that what we ought to do is distribute to those that have need. But even the Christian community refuses to do that oftentimes. Refuses to do that. And because we refuse to do it, God set up a government that doesn't. And you can argue all you want about the welfare state, you know, you got to pay taxes. So one way or another, I mean. You're not going to win. All right, you know, God's going to take it from us one way or another. There shouldn't be any need for any taxation to be distributed to a, a member 
uh, of the family and the household of God. It isn't saying here that they became communistic, but that they didn't count their possessions as personal holiness. They were willing to share them. They were willing to part with them if necessary to help those who were in need. And they continued daily with one accord. I want you to note that we're in the temple. And, and we'll find consistently in the book of Acts that the witness always began at the temple. You know, we seem to do that differently today. You know, we want to get out of the church system. But they were in the temple. They were breaking bread from house to house. They had home Bible studies. They, they ate their food with gladness and, and singleness of heart. Now, you, know, you can call that a hamburger and a milkshake if you want. But I believe that food, folks, is the Word of God. And it was eaten with singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. I discussed this briefly when we looked at the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians. Uh, if any man eat of this bread or partake of this cup in an un unworthy uh, manner, uh, I don't believe that means that he's unredeemed. As, as much as it means that, that he may, well, he may of course be unredeemed, but, that's, but that he's partaking of it in a critical manner, not in singleness of heart and purpose to learn of Christ, but to... Uh, but to, to somehow make himself worthy. He doesn't understand the significance of that bread and, the, and that wine. Um, so he's partaking in an unworthy manner. They praised God. They had favor with the people. That's not just the elect, but anyone that knew them. Uh, they had favor with all the people, and it was the Lord who added to the church daily those who were being saved. They were not added any other way. And the word saved, I believe, means deliverance, not eternal life. And just as it says in the 40th verse, save yourselves from this perverse or crooked generation. In the third chapter, we have Peter and John going up together in the temple, and there was a specific man there. Uh, the man was there, uh, your Bible says, and a certain man lame from his birth. A man that we know in, in this account is 40 years old. So here's this 40-year-old guy. He's, uh, he's been lame uh, a long time. He's coming there to beg at the temple. Uh, he should not be begging at the temple. You know, the Israelite under God's economy uh, should have supported that man. But we already have the Lord Jesus Christ telling the scribes and the Pharisees that they were straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. You know, here's a man that's been begging I don't, I don't have any idea how long, but he had been there a long time, some 40 years old, and he was carried there, there every day. Can you imagine carrying that guy to the temple and back every day? You know, just so that he could beg. And then he sees Peter and John going into the temple. Now we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has said of the scribes and the Pharisees that ye are of your father the devil. Don't be going around telling people that because you're not God. You can't do that. But that's what they were telling them. But where are they at? Where are they? Well, they're in the temple of God. They're administering the Word of God even, even though... Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ made a scathing denouncement of the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests. Yet the Lord says to His disciples, Now you do what the priest says, for He sets in Moses' seat, even though the Lord spoke of Him as a 
child of the devil. He asked alms from them, and Peter looked at him and he said, I want you to listen to me. You know, now I don't suppose anybody had ever said that to that lame man. Uh, what they probably did is want to be as far away from him as they could. He noticed that they hadn't seen him, and if they did see him, they'd, you know, just toss a coin and move rapidly on. I don't imagine in his life anyone had ever stopped and said, look at me. No, not to deify Peter here, but I think God wants us to look at him as our help in time of need. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. And of course, now we have a verse for folks who want to boast about the fact that they don't have anything, and so we need this really big offering. Peter and John had nothing. Boy, if, if alms weren't given to them, I get, you know, if they didn't receive any help, I guess they're stuck. I, don't, I do not believe that that's what Peter's saying at all. Peter said, I'm not wealthy. He's not, he's not saying that he has nothing, but he's saying that I don't have a single thing that will help you. You know, maybe another Roman coin. None of that would help that man. And I don't believe it's fair to the Scriptures to suggest that Peter and John are, are absolutely destitute. They're, both of them are broke. They're, Peter and John, are, they're as broke as the Ten Commandments. I don't believe that. John owned his own home. He was able to take Mary in and care for her the rest of his life. I don't reckon he lived on her social security checks. I have to reach the conclusion that John was able, not only in, in having his own home, but able to take on the support and the, and the care of another person in that home. Dearly beloved, we don't have a single indication in the Scriptures that these men were broke. None of the foolish appeal, appeals that we hear today for the raising of money. Peter is not complaining about his situation. Peter is simply saying that what you're asking for and you're asking for help, what you're asking for, I can't give it to you. I don't have any ability to help you with silver and gold, but what I do have... I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, of course, what you don't see there in the white spaces is the fact that Peter said to him, now, if you just, you know, well, if you just have enough faith to believe, you can rise up and walk. And of course, if the man doesn't rise up and walk, he just didn't have enough faith. And we're absolutely persuaded today that healings and miracles are the product of human faith. We see it on TV. You know, and you know, if nothing happens, man, he's got the perfect out. You simply just didn't have enough faith. Not once does Peter interrogate this man about faith. In fact, not once does he interrogate him about belief. I want you to note, it's in the temple. I do not believe that God has called us to work as monks or, or, or fly solo. That organization may be a very loose organization. I, I'm of the per persuasion it needs older, needs older men, whatever that means. It, I, I'm a little bit concerned when the oldest man is 16. But I believe it needs older men to take its oversight. You know, there may be only five or six people meeting in a home where, where two or three are gathered together. Uh, in, in my name, there will I be in the midst of it. I'm not suggesting that it needs to be a large 
the ecclesiastical organization with a building and a program and a, and a treasurer and all of that. But I do believe that God consistently in His Word operates in the midst of an organization of more than one person. You know, when the, when the Lord sent folks out, He sent them out uh, two by two. You know, when he left, he sent 11 men out, not just one. We, we, find, uh, we find Paul submissive to the organization. He went up to Jerusalem, says they didn't add anything to him, but he wasn't, he wasn't tearing the system down or suggesting that it shouldn't be there. And you don't, you don't have to spend much time thinking, really, to realize that it, it by far was not perfect. None of them are, because Christ is perfect. Peter and John were going into a very imperfect temple. It wasn't anything like the Word of God being taught there. And the man was outside the temple. Now we we are somehow somehow we are schooled that we gotta, you know, sit this man down, we gotta Oh, we got to run him through a formula. You, we got to give him some basic laws or we got to give him some explanations. We got to go through the techniques that have been developed by somebody else that will give us a 85% uh, conversion rate instead of a, you know, 15% conversion rate. You know, we got all the tricks of the trade. And once we get this man in the right, you know, physiological frame of mind, then we can pop the question to him and we can get him to accept Christ. And none of that is seen in the first, first incident of personal evangelism in the book of Acts. The fact that the man is lame, I believe, is a picture of, of spiritual inability. The fact that he's a certain man a specific man positively identified in the Word of God means that he's one of God's elect. He's 40 years old. What kind of a God do we serve that would allow one of His elect children to sit there as a beggar for 40 years or a man like Paul to be over 50 years of age before he reveals himself to him on the road to Damascus? You know, we not only have a God of love, but we have a God of purpose. I'm certain that if you could, uh, you know, just translate yourself to heaven's glory today and, and, and find that lame man who for 40 years, you know, sat outside that temple you know, somebody, some, some probably spit on him, some ignored him, some probably stepped on him. And if you were to go up to him and say, well, you know, isn't it terrible that God Almighty made you beg for 40 years before you met Peter and John? I'm certain that that man probably wouldn't even remember it. If God wanted him 40 years there as a spiritual illustration of the work of the Spirit and the choice of God, doesn't he have the right to do that? You know, we're so prone to look at that man's personal freedom and, and his personal happiness. You know, we want to sit down and cry because he can't, he can't ever play basketball or football or, or baseball. We want to, we want to speak of, of the tragedy of all of the enjoyments in his life that he missed. You know, he never skied. He never, he never played tennis. He never played golf. He never rode a horse. He never did any of those things that all of us find so enjoyable. And a God who we profess to be a God of love, just let Him sit there. You know, I, I so believe God is teaching us how devastating sin is, but, but that man was in God's plan. He was definitely an identified man who belonged to God and in God's good time, which is which in fact is nothing compared to eternity. In God's good time, 
He was met by Peter and John. In God's good time, God's messengers came. They, they did not sit down and interrogate the man about what he believed or what he didn't believe. You know, I can't help but think of the, the blind man outside the, the temple when the Lord Jesus Christ came. He was also asking for help, and the Lord gave him sight. He didn't ask for sight. He never expected sight. The Lord didn't sit down and say, now look, we got to... You know, we got to talk bluntly here. What do you think of Jesus Christ? What do you think of the Word of God? Do you know that you're a sinner? And don't you know that as a sinner, you know, and, and, and we go through all the formulas because we want to get this man to say certain things as though if he recites these words, we can walk away with a, a satisfaction. Well, at least he's going to heaven. And dearly beloved, we do not have illustrations of that in this book. At all. We don't find Paul interrogating the Philippian jailer or, or, or Christ interrogating the blind man outside the temple, nor, nor Peter and John interrogating this man. It fits in exactly with our discussions of the ministry of reconciliation. I got fabulous news for you. Fantastic news. I got great news. I have grand news for you. God has reconciled you to Himself in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't try to sit down and find out whether or not I think this is so. I, I ask a few questions and I say, you know, you know, boy, God hasn't reconciled that guy. I'll just go on my way. I wouldn't do that for anything in the world. Neither did Peter and John. No question about his faith. You know, I, I don't know how we ever got it backwards. You know, if you'll just believe, God will save you. We don't seem to realize that every illustration in the Word of God is that God redeemed His people and then they believed. But somehow we want to turn that around and put the cart before the horse. Somehow, somehow we turned that thing all around and, and, and to say, well, if, if you'll believe, God will redeem you. When the book says just the opposite. Took him by the right hand and lifted him up. I'm dead certain if Peter had walked away, that man would have found out he had strength in his legs. Some of you probably have broken a bone here or there. You know, I, I had a horse rear up, fall back on me, busted. I don't know what. It shattered four of the nine bones in my wrist to dust. You know, if, you, if you've ever had a bad break, you know, and it was immobilized for several weeks or months, you know, while you, while you healed, Take some re rehab, rehabilitation. My Bible tells me this man was born impotent as far as walking is concerned. He had never walked, not as a baby, not as a child. And now after 40 years, he's not only walking, man, this guy's jumping and leaping. I think the major portion of the miracles is often overlooked. The miracle surely is there that he was healed. But my lands, this fellow is an accomplished walker already. I think that, that speaks something of the power of God in human life. It's amazing how rapidly one grows in spiritual reality when his heart is lightened by the Word of God. If there's any willingness or eagerness on the part of one whom God has redeemed. The growth is absolutely astounding compared to that of any other discipline.
I'm not going to sit here and suggest that that a person uh, becomes a super Greek scholar overnight or knows everything there is to know about church history. But I am suggesting that there is a profound and a, an, a, an immediate response to the gospel in the life of a heart or in a heart that has been lightened by the, the command of our sovereign God. He didn't run away from the temple. He went into the temple with Peter and John. Now, I think the account there, you know, if you want to let your mind wander a bit, I, I think you can, you can only marvel at the sovereignty of God. He'd been that way for 40 years. He was there when Christ walked in the temple. Christ came to the pool of Bethesda and He singled out one man and healed him. Why not this man at the temple? 40 years. The Lord was in that temple. The Lord drove the money changers out of that temple. I recognize that the major portion of this earthly walk was separate from Jerusalem, but He, he did spend time in Jerusalem and He made innumerable visits to the temple. He must have walked by that man. It wouldn't at all astonish me if He walked so close to the, to the guy that the guy could have touched His garment. And I'm certainly convinced, absolutely convinced that he was chosen from the foundation of the world. But he walked by him as though he never saw him and it was up to Peter and John to bring the announcement of good news. The Lord didn't do it when he walked by. Peter and John could have said they had accomplished their purpose in, in simply declaring unto him truth, but he went with them. And those in the temple knew about this guy. They knew about him. Man, guy's been around 40 years. You know, hey, here he is again. Same guy. They knew about it. And they were filled with wonder. Verse 11, All the people ran together onto that which is called Solomon's porch, Greatly wondering. Folks, there is a close affinity between the person that finds out he's a member of the body of Christ and the person who tells him that. You know, I know of a man years ago who had never gone to church in his life, didn't know one single Bible verse. Somebody led him to the Lord. I, I think that's the cliche we use today. Uh, and that man was a super, superhero to him. Uh, when he heard he was redeemed, he wanted to go where that man lived. He wanted to go to the school that that man went to. He wanted to go to the church that that man went to. And it was a very, if you'll pardon my accuracy, a very oddball church. And the man who had come to know the Lord, who had come to know what God had done for him, went through a very difficult period in his life. He was finally beat up by the elders of this church and thrown out. He went to a Bible school where they downgraded him because in reading the Bible, he couldn't make it fit with what they were teaching. And he tossed and turned in a very terrible life for over 10 years as God dealt with him lovingly in the Word of God. Man's holding on to Peter and John. That's not unreasonable. Now what Peter and John could have said, you know, what we're often tempted to do, I, th I think there's many a work that, that tacitly gives God the glory. You know, there's always the, the presentation. You can see it. You know, I don't have to name any names. Uh, you know, what would you think if we changed this ministry to Stephen's uh, Bible church or... or or BHF's Bible Institute, or, or BHF College, or whatever you want to call it. You know, though we can tacitly say, well, we'll give God the glory, there's a tremendous amount of effort to highlight or, or, or emphasize ourselves. You know, did you really heal that guy, Peter? Well, yeah, yeah, I did that. Now, Peter didn't have to tell anybody that. God did it. Or, or he could have said it in such a way 
Well, well, yes, I was. Yes, I was there. I was there. Lord used me. I'm thrilled that God granted me the opportunity to be the vessel in the performance of this miracle. But He didn't do that. Peter answered the people, You men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Is that a strange thing for Peter to say? No. Not when you stop to realize that Jesus Christ had been in that city performing miracles just like that. There were blind men who could see, lame men who could walk, dead men who rose from the dead. You know, not this guy jumping around in the temple. You know, so what? You know, you got Lazarus. You know, you can go have dinner with him. And most of those people in the temple knew that. Don't, don't get the idea that somehow we're so far from the cross that nobody in this temple remembered Jesus of Nazareth and the crucifixion on the cross and the empty tomb on the third day. Why do you marvel at this? Why do you look on us as though by our own power or by our own righteousness we did this? It's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers who glorified Jesus Christ. Now look what he said. Whom first of all you delivered. You denied him in the presence of Pilate when Pilate was determined to let him go. That's the seventh verse in the Word of God that indicates that it was Pilate's determination to let Jesus Christ go. But Pilate delivered him to be crucified. The Lord said to Pilate, you don't have any power at all. The only power you have is what God gives you. And seven times in the Word of God, I'm told that Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. This is the last one. I have the statement of the Holy Spirit that it was Pilate's personal determination to set him free, but he delivered him to be crucified because that was by the de determinate will of the sovereign God. And boy, that's tactful. I mean, one can't hardly imagine a better way to start, start a gospel message right there in the temple. You know, we're often greatly concerned that we couch the message in terms that won't offend people. We have the idea that the Word of God says we shouldn't offend, and we ignore the fact that the offense spoken of in the Word of God is a doctrinal offense. Peter would have offended these people if he had, had given them any occasion whatsoever to believe that what they had done was right. That would have been an offense. And what he said was true. Can you imagine a Peter who forsook him and fled? And days later, you know, he's taken a, a tremendous chance here in the temple. These people had demanded the death of Christ. Peter's identifying himself with a known criminal who was executed by the state as far as these people are concerned. Now, I'm not in a faithful proclamation of the Word of God at at, in, in any personal risk in any fellowship that I know of. But I believe the walk of one who is faithful to the Word of God is essentially a lonely walk, not separate from the institution. Peter was essentially lonely in that temple. These were the people who had delivered Christ, denied the Holy One, and killed the Prince of Life. That's where he had to labor. I pray not that you take them out of the world system, but that you keep them in it. Keep them in it. And what he's declaring is truth, which makes no allowance for any popularity contest. It's this man in his name. So I have to reach the conclusion that the faith mentioned in the 16th verse is Peter's as given to him by God. In the last analysis, it's God's faith. But the exercise is not the man who jumped up, not the faith we hear so broadly today. You know, if you, if you just believe God would redeem you, I believe it's the faith of the preacher, not the hearer. That's what made this man strong, whom you, you see and know. The faith which is by him, Christ, the, the him there, is not the, the man Peter, 
but Christ. The faith which is by Christ has given him this perfectness in the presence of you all. You know, you're not nearly as offensive if you couch it in language that, you know, which gives some of the glory, some of the opportunity to the individual. Because that's what, that's what we've been made to be, you know, accustomed to. You know, if you do this, this, and this, you can properly expect God to do that, that, and that. That's the normal formula. But that is not what the Holy Spirit reveals Peter saying here. Now, brother, verse 17, I know that you did it through ignorance. Boy, there's a statement to make people don't not, you know, don't typically like people don't typically like to be called that. Uh, particularly when you're in the temple talking to people who are at least in their own mind, you know, relatively educated in the things of God. This is God's house, God's altar, God's holiest of holies, God's priests, God's word who know it intimately, who could quote it backwards and forwards. This is not the place to suggest spiritual ignorance. I know you did it through ignorance, and also your rulers did it through ignorance. But those things which God has before shown by the mouth of all His prophets, that Christ should suffer, He, God, has so fulfilled, God revealed that this is exactly what's going to happen to Christ. And it did, because God did it. So it was God who fulfilled it. And now I'm going to stop at the end of the paragraph there. We begin with verse 19, the Lord willing, uh, in a, next week. Uh, thank you all for listening. We love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.